Thank you, Elisa. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first off, um, I want to thank you for coming um, and everyone who organized the symposium, and in particular to Dima for um, what I think the next few days will be a very interesting and engaging discussion around a lot of the issues that we take for granted in organizing um, this biennial, which he has helped us not only to understand and come to terms with, but has, I think, done an extraordinary job in putting them into context. I would, very be, I would be very happy to do that. So I'm going to take the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about the concept of the main project itself in relationship to the larger concept of the biennial, but also to talk about the three points that organize the exhibition directly, which I hope you will have a chance to see very soon if you haven't seen it already. Um, when I was invited to think about the main project exhibition, I immediately picked up on the timing of the biennial being the fourth biennial and this potential event, non-event of the fourth industrial revolution. So there was a biennial taking place in a city which intersected the history of the 20th and 21st centuries spans really the history of, in every sense, industrialization, the uh, wars of the last century, the process of, um, I would say, the process of formation of the post-war period, in particular, the structuring form of the Cold War and of the nuclear result of, of post-war society, which we still feel today in North and South Korea, for example. The creation of what I would say are the two clouds of the 20th century. One, the shadow of the nuclear cloud in which we lived roughly since the nuclear test um, in uh, 1945, the Trinity test, um, on through the second cloud, which is a direct manifestation of the first cloud, the, the, inf the cloud of information which results from the first nuclear cloud. Um, and that the, these intersections of the October Revolution, of the Industrial Revolution, of the post-Industrial Revolution, um, even just the name change of Sverdlovsk, Ekaterinburg, Ekaterinburg, Sverdlovsk, Ekaterinburg, all these changes were really indicative of each moment of transition from these revolutions and that we had a fourth one, which was simultaneously already here but not quite yet arrived. Um, it was sort of coming but yet already a result of the other three. And roughly, if you think of the first one as a revolution of steam, you, the second one is electrification and machinery, the third, information and communication, the fourth, what I would, I would propose would be a revolution, an industrial revolution of code. So the programming code, the code of digitization, begins to come together with other kinds of codes. The genome is probably the most uh, interesting for us, as, as for our particular species, but also artificial intelligence. Uh, so you can think of systems of code beginning to merge together, and so the biological, the physical, the material, physical, biological, ecological begin to combine into one kind of order. So I, I was interested in exploring for the fourth biennial this fourth industrial revolution. But what I wanted to do is not address so much what these technologies would look like, not to do a projective, predictive, futuristic um, projection of what the future might be, but actually to look at the transformations that have taken place and that new literacy for me was partly unconscious. So it was the fact that most, uh, how many people in the audience have a smartphone? Most, uh, most of you probably have a smartphone, you're just too shy to raise your hand. We'll try it again. How many people in the audience have a smartphone? Yeah, that's more, that's more like it, yeah. How many people have read the manual to their smartphone? Okay. So this is what I'm talking about, is that you, the gestures that we animate data with are largely, we are literate in those gestures, but we don't, we've never quite learned those gestures. Not in the old way that one learned that this was an A or this was a B. Um, and so reading and literacy means something very, very different. And it's also emotive and it's physical. So it's not just, I remember when I was, when I was a child, they used to divide kids up into two different kind of categories. Those who read silently and those who read while mouthing. 
So if you, if you read when you were reading your Vedas, I'd like to say, you were considered somehow, it, it's not, you weren't reading well, because you should just read in the interior voice of your head. Uh, and so that kind of learning is not what we're talking about. That's, it's not the kind of literacy that I think is actually present in this revolution. And there are many, many others. Um, and then there's a kind of illiteracy, or a passive unconscious literacy, which is that, um, and I'm, I'm slightly repeating myself, but these metaphors are very useful. Um, so if you, I imagine most of you are familiar with the, the um, myth of the oracle at Delphi in ancient Greece. It was a place that you would go, you would ask a question, there was a hole, you asked the question into the hole, and then there's someone next that says, the hole says, uh, you will be, something will happen. Um, and it's interesting to me that we've, in a sense, we've recreated this experience um, through the Google search box, because there's this kind of hole, this portal into something, and you kind of ask a question into the hole, and then something comes back at you, which is also mediated. Not surprisingly, one of the biggest technological firms of the third industrial revolution was called Oracle. Um, and I think that this process of between asking the question into Google and getting an algorithmic response that we don't qu quite know how it works, this, this kind of opacity of, of, of how this functions is also part of this literacy. This is, all this, this is all to say that the condition that the exhibition tries to engage is the fact that we are in a transition where forms of working and forms of living and forms of dreaming and forms of playing uh, are once again being transformed. The idea is that all revolutions alter these things. They alter language, they alter gestures, um, they alter relationships, they alter even emotions. And so we want to look at the physical and the visual and the social um, effects and this, again, this combination of digital, biological, and material. And I thought the way to do this was to break it down into three transitional things. So three things that always happen in every revolution that might key us in to the transformations of the fourth. One is the image as witness. So actually, most of us every day walk around with this massive archive of images in our pockets. So it's either an images of, of how we see the world, the pictures that we take, but we have limited access to basically this massive, I would say even sublime in terms of size, archive of images daily. So you can access an image. You can conjure up almost an image of everything you can imagine. Uh, if you want to see a pig dressed in a tuxedo, you can find an image of a pig dressed in a tuxedo. I would challenge you to do this now and tell me that you didn't find it because I, I bet you will. And so this idea of this archive that is both an integral part of, the, of history, so we mediate historical events through this massive archive, but they're also an, our ongoing record of our daily lives. Right? We, we, if, if it wasn't, we wouldn't spend so much time photographing things and posting them on social media. So, and I think that we have to understand this. Do you find a pig dressed in a tuxedo? Yeah. I could, I could keep going. We could do this all day and you'll always find it. So, and the algorithm will, if it, if it doesn't, if, if it knows that it can't find it, it will make one. Uh, because it can push, it can push the user towards um, eventually arriving at that idea. And so this, 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 this concept of witnessing is quite important. One of, the, one of the things that I think I've come to realize is that the function of images representing something has profoundly changed because pictures are not, or images are not just a picture of something, but they're actually implicated in the thing, they are now implicated in the thing that they represent. Um, and part of this has to do with a phenomenon, of, of, of a recent phenomenon, which is the fact that um, civil authorities like police and, and intelligence agencies have noticed that there are many, 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 many instances now of people taking pictures of a crime while they're committing the crime. Or there is someone next to them participating in taking the picture of the crime rather than stopping it. So you have images that are simultaneously involved or part of the kind of evidence of illegality. And you also have an interesting phenomenon in which an image itself, because of its metadata, because of its high resolution because of its sociability becomes evidentiary. So you can use it to prove something 
by its very quality as an image. A great example of this would be if, uh, and this is actually the, one of the groups in the, in the exhibition, Forensic Architecture does this, what they do is they take a series of images posted on social media, say, of a bombing, and what they're able to do is by tracking all of the positions of those images, the movement of the sun, the position of relative buildings, um, what they can do is map exactly what happened, the time of the bombing, what kind of bomb it was. If you know what kind of, um, what kind of you, you basically can create typologies of ammunition based on, say, the plume of smoke. And so they can actually prove that, yes, this city was bombed. Yes, it was bombed by this class of bomb. And yes, it was bombed at this time. All from images that you, us, post on social media. This is an incredible power that images have in this sense. But at the same time, they begin also to see more than we see in them. Human beings have this very curious thing. Uh, um, we, you know, we, do, we do really stupid things like a lot of people when we leave the house in the morning, we look in the mirror to sort of adjust um, our hair or something before we leave, because that's how we want to present ourselves to the world. And of course, we should realize that at the moment you look away from the mirror, you look completely different than, when you, than you just did looking in the mirror. So we have this fixed sense that somehow this, the image is a fixed object. And I think actually today it's not like that at all. I think images in a sense are almost like viruses that replicate through us. We, there is another piece of information in an image that our vision is there to replicate it. We are a kind of vehicle for the reproduction of images. We're very useful because we like them, we share them, we make them keep moving. And, but there's something else in there that is beyond what we see in it. And I think this form of witnessing will become very, very important in the future because it also has to do with the violence that they witness. That we do incredible amounts of violence to images. And this has to do with, just to close this section, the, the great difference between deleting and erasing. That deleting something is, a, is, an, is an immaterial act of which we have no tactile, real, direct, material effect. Right? Remember, we don't look at images anymore. We touch them, we, f we fondle them, we caress them, we flick them. Right? And so we can very easily delete them. Right. Erasing is something else. Right. The act of scratching out, the act of painting over, this sort of physical act of erasure is very, very different. And so this, this simultaneous intimacy and total lack of, of, um, of, of consideration for the precarity is important, but also we need to look back at those images. We are very sophisticated readers of images, and we need to be able to understand what they actually are as well as what they actually say. The second point is choreography. I realize I'm running short on time, so I'm going to speed up. Every revolution is a revolution that changes the calendar, it changes space, it changes time, and it changes movement. All right. And so choreography is here is conceived as anything in motion. And how the motion of things, the movement of things, is affected by this revolution. In particular, I'm always interested in the fact that motion Circulation is, is, is you, can, you can index revolutions to movements. So Charlie Chaplin is the great dancer of industrial capitalism. Right? He, is the, he is the dancer who can go into the factory and turn a space of regimented production and create a kind of ballet out of this rigid regimentation, call it Taylorist, call it Fordist, of Movement. The human body will do this and make their, this, these movements productive. But there's also other kinds of circulation. The circulation of financial instruments. There's the circulation of, so there's the movement of bodies at work, the circulation of financial instruments. But also there are social choreographies, like the movement of migration and refugees. This is also part of the choreography of, of these revolutions. I'm also interested in the fact that the nature of work and, the, and this kind of choreography changes with every type of work. So every kind of work involves the change to these physical patterns. And in fact, we have become very literate dancers of this choreography. So we know these gestures. We do them every day. And I'm interested in how these gestures emerge and if we can identify a kind of birth of this dance. When did we learn it? How did we learn it? How did it come about? And of course, the great object of human transcendence, which is the human hand, um, how it continues to adapt as a mechanism 
to integrate with technology and potentially how it can even reach a point where it, it, it reaches its extreme limit by touching a surface. Right? Um, how, the, how the touch on a surface becomes the <laughs> point of access to this great beyond. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. We should pay more attention to the fact that it's touch uh, because the whole regime of Western knowledge uh, for so long was based on sight. So this may also be um, about uh, um, a certain kind of new order. We also should look at how can we resist and what forms of effects are we suffering from? Why is there, why are, you know, why do we drink more caffeine? Why are there so many ed energy drinks? Why do we do so much yoga? As, as forms of the body trying to compensate and resist things like sitting or a kind of trauma uh, that the body maintains in these shifts that again are largely unconscious. Lastly, even though we talk a lot about images and interfaces and screens, uh, it seems to me that we are still doing quite a lot of reading and writing. Uh, most information chain exchange today is actually in the form of alphanumeric systems. Um, it's important also to remember that these alphanumeric systems themselves always adapt. They always are related to a kind of adaptation. And the fact that information, even though it's structural and is everywhere, you can't actually touch it. So we have this thing that we've largely decided was going to be the basis of our economy and the basis of our society, the basis of our personal life, our love life, our sex life. But you can't actually see it. You can't feel it. You can't point to it. So we invent all these kinds of metaphors for them, the cloud being probably the most obvious. But you can see it in the effects. You can see it in the result. You can see the shadow. You can see the residue. You can see the patina. And one of those is how language adapts. And I would, I, I would, I would argue that there is this new grammar, this new literacy. There is a direct connection between something like Soviet typography and the emoji right? as two forms of adaptation to revolutionary moments. But I think there's also... For example, the reason you know, I would argue that modernist poetics in their static breaking up of language, typographical breaking up of language, is related to the kinds of work that the factory implies. It, it's self-mechanistic, fractured, and ordered. And so, of course, we have new languages. It's interesting to me that young people speak those languages fluently and are already adaptive. SMS is an example. SMS speak, which everyone says is a, is a crime against the you know, the Shakespearean orthography, even though Shakespeare never had a spelling of his own name. Shakespeare spelled his own name four or five different ways. Um, supposedly, there's this thing that SMS speak is destroying. I think it's quite interesting that it's, it's, it's an adaptation of language, actually. And these adaptations are really interesting. But what kinds of languages escape outside of this order? What kind of languages provide the intensity or directness of speech um, and how something like poetical speech can break out of the strictures or the limitations of, say, 150 characters on Twitter. Or where will, th where will this language go? And why have we not been able to invent a purely pictorial system of language um, as opposed to keep using this amazing technology invented by Sumerians on clay tablets thousands of years ago. So all these adaptations are really important. So the interest here is how can this power of speech flow outside of these interrupted flows of data, circulation, accents, right? How accents become a marker of how much you've traveled from place to place. These material registers, right? These sibboleths or shibboleths that, that register these patterns are, are quite important. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to Thank my colleagues for being so gracious and let me take up so much time. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you.